As of the recording of this video, these stories are exclusive to my channel. A Nocturnal Flight by Glass You are standing in the silent forest. You watch as the moonlight shimmers and glints off the leaves above your head. They whisper. You cannot understand. The bark and soil are fragrant. It was hot all day and now, in the soothing coolness of the night, they are joyfully releasing all of the tension accrued from under the unblinking gaze of the sun. The silent forest was not named thus for its atmosphere. Any sound one could reasonably expect to hear in a forest can be heard here as well, and a great many unexpected noises besides. You hear a snuffling sound, and when you turn you see a somewhat ordinary looking boar. Its fur is shaggier than perhaps you may have expected. Its head would come up to about your waist if it was standing closer. Is that a usual size for a boar? You're not even certain they're native to this region. The boar regards you for a moment, turns and disappears back into the woods. You'd heard that this was a lovely place for a hike, and while you will easily grant this rumor to be true, you aren't certain that you like it enough in here to remain in the dark. You hadn't intended to stay this long. It feels like night came on a little faster than is strictly decorous for the summer. Thankfully, the trail you chose is one of the better used ones and following it back out should be easy even without the sun. You didn't quite make it to the end of the trail, but there's always next time. You turn. You begin to feel strange. Your first steps back feel deafeningly loud to the point of being profane. You chide yourself for being childishly paranoid, even as you work to soften your steps. After all, it can never hurt to be mindful of what minute and delicate lives you may be crushing underfoot. A light tread will do the least amount of damage. You fall into a rhythm and it relaxes you a little. The moon is full. You don't even need to use your lantern to see. Its glow generously beautifies everything it touches. The wings of common moths flash and dance. The haggard faces of the trees cloaked in bark are multi-dimensional and picturesque. The silent forest feels peaceful. You can sense it keeping watch on itself, can sense how each living thing works to protect the other. As you pick your way around the fallen logs and protruding roots, you lose yourself in the cacophony of frogs. They are endlessly calling out to one another, weaving a sense of community from an auditory web. Somewhere near, an owl calls out, Though not an owl, you feel a playful spirit sees you and call out in response. <gasps> you shout, jubilant. Suddenly you feel very strange. You catch some movement out of the corner of your eye. That boar again. It was just turning away, folding itself back into the surrounding trees. Its movement is eerily silent. You listen harder. Or surely it must make a sound, even if very small. You do hear a footfall kind of noise, but it isn't coming from where the boar disappeared. Turning, you see what could be a man, walking at a leisurely pace down the trail a short ways behind you. You feel very strongly that he's a man, perhaps due to the height and build, although admittedly his body is obscured by a long coat and his face is hidden in a mess of scarves. He's carrying an axe with a wooden handle. Not unusual for this location, but not ideal for this time of night. You turn your back to him. It is necessary if you want to follow the trail out of here. You gamely try to affect an air of utter nonchalance as you motor off in a brisk power walk. Though not subtle, the footstep sounds you make are not loud enough to disguise the noise of his if you really listen, and nearly jump a mile as an owl call pierces the night. It is so loud that you instinctively turn. This man is much closer to you than he should have been based on how slowly he was walking. You did not hear him run. You want to turn back to the path. Exiting is feeling more vital by the minute. 
But as you begin to tilt back, you hear the owl call again. And it is definitely coming from this strange man. Worse still, the urge to answer back seizes you like an iron fist. You can feel your name in your throat, fighting for release, and it fills you with a cold and unnameable dread. You feel that you must never tell him your name even more strongly than you feel him to be a man. You resist and choke out a strangled... No! As you teeter dizzy from the effort back to your path towards the exit, you break into a run. The who is insistent, almost angry. You scream and cover your ears as you stumble. You begin to babble, feeling your own head up with yourself. Your breath and heart beat so loud in your ears that you almost can't feel the rawness of your throat. The way the cool air seems to snag on its way down. You're almost there to the end. You can see the lights of the parking lot. Suddenly you become convinced that he is right behind you. That he will grab onto the back of your shirt just before you cross from the concealment of the leaves to the protection of the light. You can't help it. You turn around. Even though he isn't as close as you feared, the sight of him still turns your insides to acid. Your eyes jump in your head and your vision blurs, as if your brain needed to perform a soft reset. You lose your balance. You fall. Your hands fly out to cushion your fall, and your palms are icy hot. It's such a relief to be feeling something that makes sense. You scramble, desperate to get on your feet, as you hear him close the distance between you. Cuts the night before you remember to raise your arms, and he's too close. Can't resist. You feel your name dragged from you like a dead log pulled from the sucking mud of a swamp. Your voice, once caged snugly in your flesh, bursts forth in terrible freedom. Eyes squint shut, forearms a brittle shield, you wait for the axe to fall. It doesn't. When you dare to look, you see that he has turned his back to you, and is walking deeper into the silent forest. Shaking, you force yourself to rise and return to your car. Pretty soon, it becomes clear that you're in no condition to drive. You pull over on the side of the road and call someone you love. They don't pick up. Even though it's late, you know that by habit this person should still be up for some time. Perhaps tonight they're busy. You try someone else. When they pick up, they don't recognize your voice. You think they're joking, but it doesn't feel funny, and when you snap, they hang up. Close to tears, you try one more person. They also pick up and do not recognize your voice. You explain the nature of your relationship to them. They don't believe you. They claim never to have had such an association. Who are you? They ask, exasperated. You want to tell them, but you realize that you don't know. Who are you? Who? A Stray Hair by Glass This story is about you. About that time you had trouble getting a hair out of your mouth. You were minding your own business, scrolling through your social spacing out. Your tongue runs along the inside of your cheeks unnoticed. Until it finds a hair. A hair in the mouth is a disgusting nuisance. The thought of accidentally swallowing it horrifying. Opening up, you shove your finger and thumb in there, still scrolling with your other hand. After a moment, you grasp the hair, pull, and shout! That hurt! Why did it hurt? You hustle to a mirror and pull back your cheek, turning it as inside out as your biology will allow. The hair stands out against the wet vulnerable pink, thick and dark. You run a finger over it, and it remains painlessly in place. It seems to be attached. After a moment, you locate your tweezers. You grasp the hair with their sharp little fingers and give it a small, cautionary tug. This does not feel amazing. This something you can bother the hospital with? Can you really wait until a walk-in clinic opens tomorrow to resolve this? You make a note of when the clinic opens tomorrow and sit back down. But, as you feared, your awareness of the hair in your mouth doesn't leave you. Your tongue strays back to it, circles around it. You find yourself sucking your cheek in, 
guiding the hair between your jaws as if to pull it out with your teeth. You can't keep doing this. The nearest walk-in clinic opens tomorrow morning at nine, but the thought of waiting even that long makes your gut twist. You're back in the bathroom, leaning over the sink, one hand pulling back the thick, elastic flesh of your cheek, the other with tweezers poised, shaking slightly, ready to grasp the hair and pull. Just once, as hard as necessary to dislodge the nuisance. You want to take a deep breath, but inhaling makes you impatient. So you just pull. It hurts. It really hurts a lot. You shout again, louder than before, and longer too, as you realize with a dizzying lurch that the hair is in the tweezer grip, but it's also still in your cheek, and your arm is extended almost to its entire length. How can this be? How is the hair that long? Your throat fills, but you force it back down because you can't handle the thought of vomiting into the toilet with the hair dragging down into that mess, but not leaving you. Rising out of the bowl as you rise to rinse your mouth, a veritable rope ladder for whatever filth occupies that porcelain chalice. You shudder, take a moment to collect yourself. You hold still, trying not to be aware of your mouth. In the mirror, the hair is barely visible. At least it isn't remarkably thick, and really, how long can it possibly be? You very gently roll the hair around two fingers. It jostles a little bit in your cheek, which is starting to feel raw. Your fingers are right up to your mouth, and staring dead-eyed into the mirror, you begin to pull. This time, it hardly hurts at all. As you watch in horrified disbelief, the hair follows the extension of your arm effortlessly. The increase of tension that would indicate the end of this trial is nigh. Never comes. Even as you wind again, both hands now working the hair with improbable ease and speed. Suddenly you notice that your cheek looks a little hollow, almost like one half of your face is leaner than the other. The implication of this, of course, is that the inside of your face is filled with hair. How much of the inside? If you pull and pull until you reach the end, will one half of your face be sunken forever? This is now officially too much for you to handle. You run to the kitchen, run back with a pair of scissors, and leaning in, Trim the hair as close to the skin as you can possibly manage. It's a heroic effort, but you're able to force the hair out of your mind and keep your tongue away until 9 o'clock the next morning, when you take a seat in the waiting room after filling out the form to wait for a doctor. Now that medical assistance is, at most, probably only three hours or so away, probably, you allow yourself to investigate your cheek and discover where you stand. The hair, naturally, is still there, and you are now very impatient for the wait you have stretching ahead to be over. At long last, you're called in to sit in an empty office for a mere ten minutes, and then, finally, you have the attention of a doctor. You can plainly see the exact moment when your explanation loses him. It happens only seconds before he cuts you off and begins to talk about your anxiety. Are you taking any medication for anxiety? He reaches for a pad, scribbles a prescription, and stands. You ask, slightly desperately, for him to please just take a look at it. He'll see what you mean, and you haven't stood up yet, so... With a reluctance, he does not trouble to conceal. He pulls on a pair of gloves, grabs a flashlight, and asks you to open your mouth. His face twists, and he places a hand under your chin and tilts your head, noticing that your cheeks are differently sized. He grabs a pair of tweezers. You know what will come next is going to hurt, and you really try not to make a sound as he yanks, and then pulls, and then whines. He picks up a small pair of scissors, cuts the hair off near your cheek, and tells you that he will order some tests and that hospital administration will be in touch with when they can get you in. 
he tells you that you can expect to wait at least three weeks. When you get home, it feels like you've walked into someone else's house. Nothing looks inviting and you cannot relax. You just want this to be over, so you walk into your bathroom, lean over the sink, open your mouth. You stick your finger in your mouth and gently pinch around with your thumb, and soon you feel something small and hard shift around slightly. None too gently, you guide the small thing towards the exit point of the hair in your cheek. Your breath is suddenly ragged. You've been forgetting to breathe. You clarify your mind into a sharp kind of focus. Line the hardness up with the little hole the hair has been escaping from and squeeze. For a moment, everything is very, very painful. And then something is loose in your mouth. You jam your fingers in and pull it out, terrified of swallowing it. You look down at your hand and see a small ball of hair, crucially attached to the hair you've been tugging on for a day. Relief floods you with such aggression that you fold down into a sitting position on the floor. You bring the little ball of hair right up to your eyes and you see that it is wound up like a small ball of yarn. You unwind it, wanting the satisfaction of seeing this nightmare ordeal reach its end, but the ball never gets any smaller. After some deliberation, you decide to pull out an aluminum mixing bowl and burn it. It smells repellent, but it does indeed go up in flames and finally disappear. I'm surprised you don't remember this. It was so upsetting to you at the time. For months after that, you would run your tongue against your cheek, terrified of what you would discover. Several times a day, you would lean towards the mirror and peel your cheeks back, both of them, convinced that the hair would return. It's been years now, and your entire face has nicely filled in. Burning that little ball was the right choice. It is exactly what I would have advised you to do if you had asked me. I don't think you have to worry about this happening ever again. I'll let you know if I remember any more stories about you. I really enjoyed reading those two stories. As of the recording of this, they're only available on my videos. Both stories were really, really fun to read. The second one was particularly disturbing. Just imagining having a hair stuck to the inside of your cheek, like, that's, I can't imagine that being a very nice feeling. If you want to support the author, there will be links down in the description. Also, if you like the video, please leave a like. And if you're new here, please subscribe so you don't miss any more content. And I have a question for you all. What would you do if you had a hair stuck to the inside of your mouth? Let me know in the comment section below. That's all the stories I have for today. Now I will see you next time with another story.